Now on BBC Two, earlier than in some listings, when our British farmers faced an almighty battle of their own. The great British countryside. Setting for one of the most pivotal battles of the Second World War. Churchill called it the front line of freedom. It was a battle fought by the farmers of Britain. When war broke out, two thirds of all Britain's food was imported. Now it fell under threat from a Nazi blockade. The government turned to farmers to double homegrown food production. The plough had become a weapon of war. It was the farmers' principal weapon of war. If they failed, Britain could be starved into submission. Now, archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman are turning the clock back to the 1940s. Over the next year, they're running Manor Farm in Hampshire, as it would have been during the Second World War. Yes. This time, the team approached 1940, when Britain's cities were bombed by the Nazis in the Blitz. They'll experience how the countryside defended and protected the cities. One at 8,000, Spitfire. Revived old crafts to prepare for the biggest evacuation in history. Peter, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, oh. Jop and cut, come on, keep up with the claims. And celebrate the first Christmas on ration. Put it all to the back of your mind and have what fun while you can. The King. This is the untold story of the countryside at war. By November 1940, Britain had been at war for 14 months. Under the watchful eye of war agricultural executive committees, farmers had grown over two million extra acres of crops in a drive to double homegrown food production. But Britain faced an unprecedented onslaught. In the summer of 1940, the Battle of Britain saw the German Air Force attempt to destroy the RAF in preparation for a full invasion. They failed, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill saluted the courage of its pilots as a turning point in the war. The gratitude of every home in our island goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. But the bombing of Britain's cities and ports would continue. The Blitz killed some 40,000 civilians. That first wave of bombing was aimed not just at London, but also at the port towns along the south coast. Portsmouth and Southampton came in for a hammering, night after night after night. And there was no underground to shelter in if you were in Southampton. Huge numbers of the population actually slept in the fields. Aerial bombardment was a terrifying concept, endangering civilians in Britain's cities as never before. So over three million women and children were moved to the safety of the countryside. The largest evacuation of people in Britain's history. Farms, with their many outbuildings, were expected to accommodate as many people as possible. Yeah, it's not the best candidate, is it? And that thing there is just too big to even consider heating. 
Alex and Peter are checking Manor Farm's barns for potential places to accommodate evacuees. This is another candidate. Yeah. There are a few holes on that roof, though. Oh, yeah. It's actually quite significant, really. There's what? There's like one, two, three, four. There's four holes on this side. To make room for evacuees here, they must make urgent repairs to the roofs of the barns. We just haven't got anywhere near enough beds if we've got all these people coming. So I'm just going to have to knock something up quick. They're going to have to be pretty crude. With imports restricted and factories switching production to weapons, in 1940, everything was in short supply, including furniture. Word was, all these townspeople were on their way. They had nowhere else to go. They were being bombed out of their own homes. And the country suddenly had to absorb huge numbers of extra people. So how do you do it? You know, where do you find the facilities? Where do you find the beds? Where do you find the bedding? Where do you find the food? Where do you find the pots and pans? And it all had to be done so fast. Up and down the countryside, villagers of all sorts were busily gathering together everything they could to accommodate this influx of really rather desperate people. Well, doing as an emergency bed, wasn't it? Building materials, too, were in short supply. Bombing destroyed thousands of factories and houses, all of which needed to be repaired. Brick and tile factories couldn't keep up with demand, so people in the countryside revived old crafts to produce them. Good afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> afternoon, lads. Right. Nice. Oh, you guys, if you come ready for work. And a picnic. And a picnic. <laughs> all right, it's just the weather. Alex and Peter need roof tiles to repair the barns for evacuees. So they're calling on experts in traditional crafts, Colin Richards and Mick Kruper. What is it? It's a tile making machine. <laughs> that is quite something. It hasn't seen action for a long time, so we're recommissioning it. Can't buy these anymore. <laughs> this is a bit of a beast. You put clay in one end, and right. in theory, you get tiles out of the other. How many do you need? Probably a, a few hundred. Right. Into um, the hundreds, definitely. Yeah. So we need to get busy then. The first job is to soften the clay from which the tiles will be made. Dance, man. <sighs> yeah, this needs to be pliable. Otherwise, there's no hope for, of this going through the machine. Yeah, well, let's get it, get it all in. Get it all in? Yeah. Ooh, good lad. Squeezing the clay through the slot requires a great deal of power. Colin is hoping the petrol engine is up to the task. Are you ready? Well, yeah. I'm ready when you are, boys. Bring him in gear. OK. OK. Yep. Yeah. Currently, it's bringing the ram up to the clay in the box. Bit of pressure, boys. Oh. Oh. Peter's been handed the vital job of cutting the moulded clay into individual tiles. Oh, oh. oh. Peter, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, oh. You're on piece work, Peter. Chop and cut. Come on, keep up with the clay. <laughs> Peter needs to raise his game at the moment. Whoa! Cut. There we cut. go. Cut and cut. Okay, yeah. clutch. Right. Right. So, how many did we get out of that run, on, Peter? Done. One, two. I reckon three, actually. <laughs> I'll put 297 tiles to make. Put it down and let's get on with it. Yeah. Not an after. Here we go. Oh, oh. look at that. Okay, got him, Peter. <laughs> after a bomb attack, bricks often remained intact, so could be reused. Tiles, on the other hand, easily shattered, so new ones were in great demand. The war distorted everything, you know, with the damage in the big cities. The, the brickworks and the tileworks were working overtime and there wasn't any spare capacity 
and it was a case of make do and mend going back to basics right. and if you had the knowledge and the skill to make tiles yeah. this is what you do few had produced tiles this way since before the first world war During the war, imports of cotton and linen were severely restricted, so bedding was in short supply. Ruth's following government advice and recycling old fabric to make patchwork quilts for the evacuees. I've been making these little pockets, like every now and again when I've got a little bit of time, I've been making these little pockets. I just run them up on the machine and then stuff them full of feathers. The bags are made from scraps of material known as ticking. Ticking is just um, a really, really tightly woven cotton. It has to be tightly woven, otherwise the feathers work their way out, you see, because like, the end of a feather is really quite pointy. And um, on ordinary fabric, if it was just like, say, apron fabric, you can push it straight through there. So that would be really uncomfortable and gradually the feathers would work their way out. So old mattress covers, old pillows, they all are covered in, in ticking great for making quilts. So then, oh, I've got my thimble and my needle, I just sew each bag up. And this is sort of part of this British patchwork tradition. The idea of making, you know, stuffed pockets, great huge fat stuffed crude pockets, which I'm going to sew together into something, well, I think perhaps to a modern eye it would look more like a duvet than anything else. But this is about warmth. It's amazing how quick it grows. Across five and a half ricks, and then everything's square to start off with. To harden the tiles, they must be fired in a kiln. But with no access to industrial kilns, during the war, temporary ones were built, using whatever materials were to hand. Have we got many more to go? No, this is the, the last layer. What sort of temperature are we looking for here? We're going to need to get up to about 900. 900 degrees? Yeah. That's going to be really difficult though, isn't it? It is in these conditions. There's, you know, quite a challenge ahead of us, really. In these freezing November conditions, maintaining a constant temperature of 900 degrees requires some clever engineering. We've got to create four little chimneys because we need to get the heat all the way round the perimeter of the kiln. And the, as we move from one corner to another, we can suck the heat across the stack. So the heat is drawn to these four corners then. Tease up, guys. That's very kind, thank you. You got to the stage now, your kiln's basically complete, but everything's very, very damp, and we need to dry that out slowly over a couple of hours, because if we drive the heat up too quickly, it's just gonna burst them tiles. The kiln must burn for two days and two nights. This will require over a ton of firewood gathered from the forest. To help them cut it up, Alex and Peter have dusted off the farm's 1940s power saw. It looks extremely dangerous, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, the, what is it, the Avon power saw? Have you ever heard of Avon power tools? No, no. It's not that company that went into prosthetic limbs, is it? <laughs> Nearly, nearly, nearly. It wants to go, doesn't it? It yeah. just wants to kick into life. Yes! Yes! Can you use it now? One, two, three. Are you ready? Into One. gear. Ruth's make do and mend quilts for the evacuees are taking shape. So this four 
When I've done them together there, will fit into that gap. <laughs> to be honest, I'm having to resist making it overly pretty. There is a sort of temptation to slow down and start doing beautiful things and make it look gorgeous. I mean, even a couple of stitches made in a, you know, in a little pattern here, and you'd start to not only hold the feathers in place, but it'd, you know, improve the look enormously. Isn't it nice and warm under there, Henry? <laughs> OK, chaps, looks like Grub's up. It wasn't just women and children who were relocated to the countryside during the war. So was 20-year-old Don Sutherland. But Don wasn't an evacuee. He was conscripted into farm labour by the government because, like 61,000 men and women, he refused to fight. I decided to register as a conscientious objector uh, when the call-up came. I objected on religious grounds. It was a very difficult decision to make. I, I've always believed that you love your enemies and uh, you, you don't kill them, you know, you, you, don't, you don't try and hurt them. Right. That must have been a very, very difficult time of your life. It, it was difficult. You, you could only speak the truth and say that you didn't... You couldn't do it yourself. And I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't go out and kill people, and that's what war's about. Were there problems trying to convince the authorities as, as to why you, you felt you needed to, to object? Oh, well, the usual question is, what would you do if a German did, did such and such a thing to your daughter or your sister or your mother, and that sort of thing, yes. Right. Uh, but I don't think that's questions are really uh, sensible questions to ask, really. Mm. Uh, one does not do, know what one would do in an emergency. Mm. I only know that there are better ways of doing it uh, than that. Some 5,000 conscientious objectors were imprisoned. But Don was one of the lucky ones, spending the rest of the war as a farm labourer. Wow, so you're threshing out, and that's the middle of winter. The middle of winter, that yes. That must have been cold there. Yes, it was. <laughs> and that, that's, that's one of uh, myself. That's the sugar beet? That's the sugar beet, a cartload of sugar beet. Right. You know, I, I was an office worker because I worked in an office for seven years. Yeah. So it was completely new to me to work with my hands, but I, I think it's, uh, it's good for any young man to do that, really. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the work you did in the fields, bringing in these harvests, did you, did you feel, even inadvertently, that this was part of the war effort and that you were in some way doing your bit towards supporting Britain at that time? Well, indirectly, I suppose you are, really. I, I don't uh, deny the men going out there were making a much bigger sacrifice than I was. Yeah, yeah. I must admit that. Yeah. Uh, but it's what, the, it's what they're having to do that, yes. that, that I disagreed with, you see. Yeah, yeah. It was always accepting that you, you fight, and that's yeah. it. Yeah, of course. Uh, without realising what war's like. By December 1940, the bombing of Southampton and Portsmouth had reached a new intensity. Thousands more evacuees flooded from the cities to the countryside. A bit nervous. Put my best coat on, make a good impression. I don't know who we're getting. Children under five were accompanied by their mothers. Hello, welcome to Manor Farm. Who have we got here then? We've got uh, Ernest. And Maureen, welcome to my home. Thank you very much. <laughs> Someone who remembers evacuees arriving here over 70 years ago is Betty Rudd. I found these mothers and these children, and they were weeping and in a terrible state. The yeah. children were crying and feeling miserable. Why, why, why can't we go home, Mummy? You know, mm. why, why do we have to stay here, Mummy? 
and uh, it was really very tough. And that was my first experience, actually, of evacuees. The government assigned billeting officers in every village to find accommodation for the evacuees. Betty's father was the officer for the area around Manor Farm. Yes, my father's here All right. in this long overcoat. Yeah. There were an extraordinary amount of people there with big houses, old time gentry. They didn't want to know at all the people of the butlers. Mm. <laughs> we had a fight. They thought yes. they were above it. Indeed, yes. My father just marched in and that was it. <laughs> and the people who were being billeted out of the countryside were not countryside people. No. They were very much townies with different ways. That was the problem. Uh, they wouldn't eat their greens. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted fish and chips, and we encouraged them to actually grow vegetables, a lot of these uh, children, and, th and they did. They were quite interested in that, really. It is one of the things about the war, isn't it? All sorts of different groups of people had yes. to learn about each other. Yes, they did. Town people had to learn about the countryside. Yes, and yes. Country people had to learn about town people. Yes, their life would be, never be the same again, would it? No, no. It certainly wouldn't. There we go. On your beat. <laughs> Many evacuated children were put to work, helping farmers to meet the government's demands of doubling food production. Don't get mad like this in Portsmouth, do you? <laughs> For children from the cities, the countryside was full of new encounters. Many had never seen a chicken, cow, or pig before. She's a big pig, isn't she? Yeah, she's fat. <laughs> Not as cute as the others, though. She's not as cute as the others, is she? She's big and scary. <laughs> to make room for more evacuees, the boys are making roof tiles to repair outbuildings. They've been firing for 24 hours, but the windy conditions are causing unexpected problems. We had sort of gale force winds. We've tried to slow it down, but what's happened is we've almost got a blast furnace. All that heat has expanded the kiln, mm. and so we've needed to restrain it. Otherwise, it would have collapsed, and we'd have lost all that effort, we'd have broken our tiles, and it would have been disaster. Well, I suppose at the moment the flames aren't coming up anymore, so we need to no. get some more wood yeah, on the fire. It's died down a little bit, and you need to keep that heat going through. You can't afford to let this temperature drop when we get to these critical stages. Get some of these right to the back of the furnace. It's almost like a sleeping dragon, and as soon as you stoke it up, then, you know, the fire leaps out of the kiln. Tending kilns in all conditions, night and day, is tough work. But Collins heard stories of how tile makers made the job a little bit more bearable. I thought we might try and rig ourselves up a still. We got apples and um, distill some um, local hooch. What do you think? <laughs> I think that sounds like a good idea. So you're talking about using this to distill alcohol? Yeah. The, the, the reason I know about this is my uncle did this during the war. Um, he worked at a, a brick and tile works. And, um, you know, the heat was used for sort of cooking any game they caught and for uh, making liquor, really. The question is, though, Colin, is it legal? If we sort of treat it as medicinal, right. then I think we, uh, we might be able to get away with it as long as we don't sell it. A little drop of medicine <laughs> to soothe the aches and pains. <laughs> Alcohol has a lower boiling point than water. So when this fermented apple juice is heated, the alcohol in it evaporates first and can be collected. We can put, put it on the heat now. Collins improvised a distillation plant from a bike inner tube, a water bottle and a saucepan. So we fixed that to that. That's worked well. Because we're joining metal to metal, the inner tube acts like a gasket. What we're going to do now is use the heat from the kiln to slowly sort of boil the mash that's in there. And with the water bottle, that's going to act as our first condensing chamber. And then the alcohol should come down the pipe. And because it's so cold, this should condense out so that what we get in here, the drips, is going to be our distilled alcohol. I know Peter's got his tongue hanging out at the moment. But <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's already conversation in that bottle. Oh, 
Oh, Sweet. don't blame her. Look at her, sat all indoors, nice oh, and Oh, she looks lovely. Come on, my lovely. Come on, Snowflake. Hello. <laughs> the government's drive to double food production meant farmers had to reduce their livestock in favour of growing crops. Crops produce considerably more calories per acre than livestock. With meat becoming scarce, the government encouraged people to set up pig clubs. Raised communally on kitchen scraps, half the meat went to the government, with the rest divided up between the members. Good girl. Come on, Snowflake. Their piglet, Shorty, is coming on well. But Ruth and fellow pig club member Debbie Underwood want to breed a replacement for when the time comes to slaughter him. Come on, I've got another treat waiting for you. So she's taken his mother, Snowflake, to spend some time with local boar, Douglas. There's a good girl. Go on, Snowflake. Does she go straight in with Douglas, or does she have to have a few days separate from the piglet before she's introduced to the boar? We come into season three days after she's been weaned from her piglets. Right. And so that's what we'll do. We'll put her in now, and that all these hormones will encourage her that in three days' time, she will She'll come into ready. season. Come, come on, on then, you. Snowflake. Off we go. Come on. Come good on. Good girl. But things are not going to plan. <laughs> Somehow, Shorty has escaped to follow his mother. Oh, oh right. how on earth did you get out, Shorty? Well, we'll have to find where they're escaping from because... Uh, That's not good, is no, it? No, because otherwise I'll just follow her to the boar. The, the gate's still closed. Look, there's oh, a hole in the wire. Look at that. Neck. Before we take her to the boar, we're going to have to fix that because otherwise Shorty's going to be straight out of there. Yeah. Always the way. <laughs> Actually, actually, you might be lucky. Yes! Whoa, look at that. Well done, that woman. Right. Whoa. Speedy, there we go. Speedy, speedy. Right. That's Douglas. Him with the hairy chops. Here he is. Hello, gorgeous boy. Yeah, this is Douglas. He loves a back scratch. Um, he's only served about three cells so far. So uh, hopefully many happy years ahead of him. There we go. Look like they're having fun together, don't they? <laughs> it's the final night tending the tile kiln, and the homemade still has produced a tonic to help the team cope with the cold. Well, we're on our sixth bottle at the moment, so... Uh... Wow, you know, it's uh, it's really sort of taken off. I think, you know, to toast the kiln, yes, we ought to have a little snifter. Right, OK. <laughs> that looks clear enough. It mm, certainly does. Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's very pleasant. <laughs> I find this medicinal, actually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's not long before Colin's tonic is making the hard graft altogether more appealing. He thanks you guys for a fantastic experience, fantastic kiln. They must endure just one more freezing night tending the tiles at the kiln. To the, the kiln. kiln! To the kiln! To the kiln. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa. Although the government encouraged farmers to cull livestock in favour of growing crops, they made one exception. Come on, girls. Dairy cattle. Time we got you indoors, you know. Milk was seen as essential to the health of the nation, particularly for children. With cold weather on the way, the farm's precious dairy cattle must be taken indoors. The government set strict targets for milk production that dairy farmers had to meet. So keeping the cattle in top condition was paramount. It's not just about keeping the cows fit and healthy, though obviously that's really important. It's also about the quality of the milk. And we have got to keep the quality and the quota, the quantity, up right through the winter. Yeah, that's really important. Come on, you know you the go. way. Over winter, the cattle will be fed silage, fermented vegetation made by Alex and Peter. Go on then, on you go. Good girls. Yeah, Sarah, man. move. I'm always amazed how much you can taste what a cow's been eating in the milk. Yes, that's a definite difference, isn't, isn't there? Isn't there, just. Of course, another reason we need to look after them is they're all in calf. Yeah. So they're all due next spring, so we want to take good care of them. 
She looks like she's got twins. She's huge, isn't she? After two days of firing, the kiln is left to cool. And the tiles to repair the barns for evacuees should be ready. It's been an awful lot of work that's gone into making this kiln, into firing these tiles, into making the tiles. Yeah. And uh, we have no idea what the results are. Well, One false move with a brick, if Colin slips and it lands on the tiles, we could smash a whole load of them. Colin's concerned that the harsh winter conditions may have affected the firing of the tiles. So what we're looking for is a ring like a bell. Sounds like magic. Mm. That sounds good. That is so, superb. Will this match your on your farm? Uh, it's going now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fussy, and I don't. No, I don't think people would have been. It's a good bunch of towels, is that? And all on bed. Alex and Peter head back to the farm to repair the buildings so they'll be ready for more evacuees. Well, you're a braver man than me, Alex. These new towels certainly look the part. I think we'll probably use the best part of 20, 30 on this side of the building. It leaves us with a couple of hundred for some of the major farm buildings. There we are. With the roof repaired, Alex and Peter furnish the building with roofs, beds and quilts. not the most salubrious of uh, accommodation on the farm, but it's warm, it's dry, better than being in the city centre of Southampton. That's it, you come this way. That's it, Mummy's coming in as well. Most had no idea when they would ever return home. How's that then? Is that nice and comfy? Although rural areas like this were seen as safe havens, they weren't necessarily quite as safe as they first appeared. There was a top secret operation to lure enemy bombers away from the cities and into the countryside, codenamed Operation Starfish. Well, I think this is the remnants of the command post of Starfish, or at least the Starfish in this area. Only the first wave of German bombers were fitted with navigation systems. They dropped firebombs on the target, lighting the way for the heavy bombers. But by lighting decoy fires in the countryside, the bombers could be led off target. Very, very thick concrete, reinforced. From this armored bunker on Manor Farm, the decoy operation was put into action. So that's the itch in there, isn't it, with all the sort of industrial yep. zones of Southampton. Yep. The place that the German bombers really want to target. Yeah, now if you go a little bit further east, you've got a similar bend in the river. So in the landscape, it looks almost identical, yet other bombers are going to be drawn to that site. And instead of raining their bombs down on a city centre, on people and on industrial heartlands, they're actually raining their bombs down on fields. OK, yeah. and what have we got there? Manor Farm. Here, decoy fires would have been ignited once the incendiary fires in Southampton were under control. But this wasn't the only way the countryside helped protect cities from German bombers. So this is the Royal Observer Corps? That's right, yes. And uh, we're part of the Royal Air Force and we provide the overland um, observation service for them because their radar only looks out to sea. Neville Cullingford served in the Royal Observers. The um, table you see here, the, the map, this yep. is a small segment of the main map 
on the control table at Winchester. So that's our little piece of the Basically group. Basically what's within. Visual right? range of us. So you see the young women with their long sticks and the boards and they're pushing out things around on a board. We're providing the information for those girls. That's right. She will be putting your plots on the table that we've observed from here. A huge network of civilian volunteers operated like a human radar, 24 hours a day, tracking enemy aircraft. In the countryside, this job often fell to farmers. You actually had to have somebody out here on duty, out in the open. If yeah. it was pouring I mean, with rain. This is basically standing mm, in a field all night, isn't it? Standing in a field all night. We did have quite a sad number of, um, of the older um, men who actually died of pneumonia because they really? were so... Really? Just got so cold. You really felt you were mm. doing your bit if you were stood out here. That's yeah. right. And Seeing the planes go over, doing something about it. That's right. And the ones yeah. that um, the RAF weren't able to shoot down um, were hopefully decoyed by the local starfish site so that they actually um, dropped their bombs in, you know, on a poor farmer's field or yeah. on his farm Rather as opposed to on, on a, a city. Rather than on a whole load of people. Yeah. Decoy fires were often just simple wooden baskets filled with flammable material. We're just knocking up some baskets a la Mode 1 Operation Starfish. Overseeing the operation is military expert Jerry Sutcliffe. Well, and you? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Excellent. Have you worked out how to set them off yet? Well, I was going to try and do it remotely by remotely sending Peter over here with a match, but I have a feeling that would take uh, the best part of the night to try and get them all lit. We can arrange something with some batteries and uh, some pieces of wire. Current should go down, which will heat up the fuse. OK. Which will go bang, and hopefully the rest of it will go with it. So we can be actually sat yeah. quite a way away yeah. then. That's okay. the idea. Patterns of fire baskets were arranged to look like burning buildings and flammable liquids like turpentine, creosote and paraffin gave the impression from the air of factories and fuel dumps going up in flames. All right, that's largely that should catch quick. If you stick some of the inflammable liquids and in that on there, okay. I can get it wired up. All the fires were triggered remotely using electrically operated detonators from the safety of a bunker. Trail that wire out. Okay, to somewhere safe. So, Jerry, we're in a situation now where we've got our fires ready to light. Now, we'd in effect be waiting for a call mm -hmm. from somewhere like Southampton, mm -hmm. industrial area. Mm -hmm. They will have um, dampened out all of the incendiary bombs there. Mm -hmm. They're then putting in a call to us, mm -hmm. at which point we act. Mm -hmm. When we get the signal. Okay, so all we're right. waiting for that call. That's correct. Neville's teaching Ruth how the Royal Observers tracked an identified aircraft. Um, we have a height bar here um, yeah. on which the number one observer sets the height. Yeah. And when you report it, if it's 6,000 or 5,000, you report it as five or six. Or right, I just seven. don't bother to mention the thousand because no. everybody knows it's thousands That's of right. feet. It's all okay. a thousand. Um, all number one does is to sight the aircraft and follow it round. And when he says on, that means that wherever the square is, that's the report you give. Right, in that's this right. case is 8168. Yeah. Direction? Direction. It's which direction he's going. Ah. Yes. OK, so okay, he's so heading yeah, say north. north. One. One at whatever I tell you. And then and I... She acknowledges it by saying thank you. It's time to put it all into practice. On. April 4. April 4. 8365, heading. North, one at 8,000, Spitfire. Thank you. At the bunker, Operation Starfish is about to spring into action. Are we going together here? Yep. Go. If all went to plan, bombs would have soon been raining down here on the fields of Manor Farm rather than on Southampton. 
it's difficult really to measure the success of Operation Starfish. You know, in many ways, you look at Southampton today and it is an absolute shadow of the city it was before the Luftwaffe raised it to the ground. Really, they flattened the entire city, so it can't have been that effective. But at the same time, if Operation Starfish saved just one life, then it was worthwhile. By December 1940, Despite the valiant efforts of the Royal Observer Corps and Operation Starfish, across Britain, 24,000 civilians had been killed in the Blitz. Hundreds of thousands had been made homeless, and millions were displaced. Yet the nation was determined to celebrate Christmas. It really was the only sort of unifying celebration that you got during the war. I mean, bonfire night obviously had to be cancelled. Blackout, makes sense. Easter, well, with no chocolate, that was a bit of a damp squib. Christmas was the one big community-wide celebration of the year. And that means that shortages or no shortages, I've somehow got to pull it all together and create something that people recognise the sort of Christmases they were used to. So Ruth's planning a Christmas meal and dance. She's keeping the evacuees occupied by making decorations for the cottage. Oh, good, you are nice and careful. I thought you'd be the lad for the job. So many town children who are, you know, trying to get used to country living for the first time in their lives. You also get the fact that many of the hosts out in the countryside were trying to get used to children. Not just town children, but any children. There was no sort of rhyme or reason, really, to the billeting. And people who were lifelong bachelors suddenly found themselves with a house full of kids. So good job I know some things how to keep you lot occupied, isn't it? <laughs> That's looking nice. I like this. Alex is also preparing for Christmas. With factories working overtime on the war effort, toys were in very short supply. The government came to the rescue with advice on how to make your own. Uh, I've got a pamphlet here. This is called Improvised Toys for Nurseries and Refugee Camps. These are the sort of toys that would put a smile on my face today. Here we've got a little little horse you can ride on, and a rocking horse, and it gives you all the patterns. And here, these are from cotton reels. This little man here is made entirely out of cotton reels. And there's a, I like that one, that's a dragon. Taking inspiration from the pamphlet, Alex is making a spitfire out of old tin cans. I've already made the prop. This is the propeller. I've got an old roofing nail there, which I'm going to um, somehow fix in there. So that, that spins. But I'm just hoping that, um, you know, that these toys bring a bit of light relief during our, our wartime Christmas celebrations. And there's actually a lovely line in here which says, <clears throat> some children may have passed through such horrors or be so weakened by illness or malnutrition that they have temporarily lost the creative art of play. A toy which they may carry with them always may do far more than we might imagine to restore the health and confidence and peace of mind to a child. So what we're trying to make is fake sparkly snow. <laughs> It's like glitter, it's like cheap form of glitter. Like so many other things, actual glitter was in short supply. I mean, you can hardly justify having a glitter making factory during wartime, can you? Just make a, I've got a load of Epsom salts here and then I just want as little amount of water as I possibly can to make them all dissolve. There we go, look at that. Scarcely liquid. Do you fancy a bit of sparkly on your lanterns? Yeah, can you be nice? Yeah. Yes. It's going to need some guns if it's going to shoot the Luftwaffe down. So we'll put a little nail in there. Mm. 
shame to give this away. By December 1940, nearly four million tonnes of merchant shipping, including desperately needed food, had been lost to German U-boats. The usual Christmas fare of Turkey had become scarce as farmers turned away from livestock in favour of crops. So the government suggested an alternative. I've plumped for something that the Ministry of Food suggested, something called a murky. <laughs> Dreadful sounding name, isn't it? That's awful. It's a mock turkey. And these parsnips, they'll be his legs. It's basically sausage meat, sort of glorified stuffing. <laughs> Mind you, that is between 15. Right, just straight all in, I think. Clunk. Now comes the crafty bit. According to the recipe, the mixture must be moulded into the shape of a real turkey. We shape that into something. What shape are oh, turkeys on a plate? OK, parsnip legs. Oh, that might have to do. The one benefit, though, of having so many people in the house is access to their ration books. <laughs> Basically, as soon as they're billeted with me, they have to hand their ration books over to me. And then I can, you know, I'm in charge of doing all the shopping, doing all the food. Which means that you get sort of uh, economies of scale. It's all a bit more efficient when you've got a larger number of you. This says it all, this does. That there, one pound, four ounces of bacon. That is five people's ration for the week. You know, one person's ration, two little rations, you couldn't really do much with. But when you get a block of five people's rations, you can start to do a bit more with it. You've got a few more options. It makes a bit more sense. There he goes. One mock turkey. Ready for the oven. As well as caring for evacuees, the farm work must go on. Now the cows are inside for winter, they need mucking out daily. It's just a sort of job that would have been undertaken by conscientious objectors. This way. And this as way. usual, the government had some advice. Right, well, as it says in the leaflet here, dung must not be wasted, chaps. OK, I'll be leaving this by your bedsides later tonight for you to read through. I mean, obviously, as a farmer, we know that this has the ability to fertilise the fields. But failing to use it, we're also uh, doing our country and ourselves a poor turn. Yeah. Got your shovels? Yep. Great yeah. stuff. Tom and Lauren are getting their first taste of life on a farm. There we have it in operation. Liquid manure. Come on. In, 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 in. So coming from the city, Lauren, uh, is this something you're used to? Uh, no. No? <laughs> <laughs> if you, once you forget what it is you're standing in, yeah. it's actually not so bad. Yeah. The great thing about farmyard smells is the longer you spend with them, the less you notice them. <laughs> and once this had been the mainstay of all fertilising on farms, but it had been superseded, really, by artificial fertilisers, which it was just sort of cheaper to, to, to buy in. But many of the fertilisers, things like a potash, for example, had come from places like Germany. So to make up for that shortfall, the government were advising farmers to turn back to this natural manure. There's a nice lot of urine in there as well. It's a nice lot of ammonia, which, again, is another really good part of the whole fertilising process. It's all for the war effort, though. That's what you have to keep reminding yourself with every shovelful. Think about where are you reading? Tomorrow, they will celebrate Christmas, and many in the village will attend the local dance. So Ruth and Peter are learning to foxtrot. This it should be easy. This is supposed to be the easy dance that everybody knew. It's not quite the pogo, is it? It's not quite. <laughs> Dancer Lisa McLean has come along to teach Ruth and Peter the steps. 
help. Hi. Hello. We really, really, really need your help. Well, help? we've been trying to turn the foxtrot. We got the book, <laughs> and we've been. Um, we're not going very far, though, really, have we? I'm not surprised. You really are not going to learn from that. Uh, so you think I should just ditch the book? I should. Throw it. <laughs> the Foxtrot was developed in 1920s New York and during the war reached the peak of its popularity. Let's try it. So two slow walks forward. So it's slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick. Easy, eh? <laughs> Why don't you try it together? Is that it? That's it. Well, Ready? So Here we go. Yeah. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick. quick. Very good. <laughs> Up until the 1950s, the foxtrot was the most popular dance, and early rock and roll records were categorised as foxtrots. Slow, quick, quick. So slow. would absolutely everybody be able to do this? Everybody would have known this dance. It was a really, really social thing yeah. to do. It's quite chatty, though. You can actually chat while you're dancing, can't you? I you're not so. leading. <laughs> <laughs> slow, slow, quick, quick. quick slow. Slow. Oh, you're turning the wrong slow. way now. Oh, no! Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Disaster has struck. <laughs> The team are celebrating Christmas Day 1940 style by inviting evacuees and neighbours to their austerity Christmas meal. Well, certain someone seems to have uh, worked his way over here. Oh, hello. Yeah, hello, hello fellas. Henry. Henry. It's a chance to sample the delights of wartime mock delicacies. The smell's really, really good, though, doesn't it? It's very nice, yes. So what is it, goose? <laughs> you should be so lucky. It's known as murky. Why is it called murky? Mock turkey. Mock turkey, <laughs> right. Quite mungry. I've got to say, this actually looks more appetising than a dry as old boots turkey. Anybody interested in a parsnip leg? Well, half a leg. You'll have a half a leg. <laughs> Is it edible? Very good, Ruth. Really. Very good. You've done a marvellous job. Nice and juicy. Stuffing is the favourite part of my Christmas dinner. Mm -hmm. So that is my favourite Christmas dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go, Henry. Have some murky. Henry loves the murky. It does. He does. Oh, that's good. I think that brings us round to present time, doesn't it? That's for gobbling down your mince pie. There we go. Happy Christmas, Finn. Ryan, as well. Oh, it's Spitfire. It's meant to be. It is a Spitfire. It's a tractor. There's a special present for you, Ruth. Oh, my goodness. Magazines often included instructions for homemade gifts. Oh, a hat! Oh, fun oh, gosh, that's fantastic! A little tilt hat for you, Ruth. On the front, like yeah, that? That's it, on the side. On the side. That's it. Made from a man's trilby hat. Made to amend. Really? Cut you, down? It is, yep. Yeah, I am really that. impressed. Thank made on my own very fair hands. Consumer goods became scarce as factories were turned over to war work, so presents tended to be practical items. Right, now, next up, Ruth. Mm -hmm. No prizes for guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, unwrap it, see what it is. Oh, I can't imagine what this is! <laughs> to Alex, thank you all. I'm be Maybe I've got an aeroplane as well. Very fragrant. <laughs> So, are you trying to tell me something, guys? In 1940, soap was, in fact, the most popular of all Christmas presents. Mm, that's yeah. a familiar smell. <laughs> Happy Christmas to everybody, and let's hope we're all here for the next one. After lunch, everyone heads to the village dance hall. It was a chance, just for a few hours, 
to forget the horrors of war. Bombers overhead, mm. people being blitzed out of their homes, you know, the war really coming home. And then suddenly, you can just forget it all. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I, there's, <laughs> there's no way I can imagine the stress that everyone was under yeah. during the war, but I can see how this would have been such a release. Yes, you can, can't you? I mean, people are losing their loved ones by this point. People are being bombed out of their hands. The whole hardness of war is really starting to bite home. Yeah. And here we have the community just yeah. letting their hair down. Letting their hair down. Forget it all. Just yeah. put it all to the back of your mind and have what fun while you can. While you can. Make the most of it while you can. Ladies and gentlemen, the king. The king. The, king. the king. And to absent friends. Absent friends. God save our gracious king. Long live our noble king. God save the king. Save Despite the brief respite for Christmas, Britain would have to fight on for another five years. The pressure on the wartime farmer would get even greater as they battled to defend, shelter and feed the nation. Next time, the team faced the conditions of 1941 when the Nazis engulfed Europe and demands on farmers increased. <laughs> the farm gets a government inspection. Uh, kind of like the iron fist in the velvet glove. Production steps up. I am an absolute bag of bones. And in the darkness of war, there's new life on the wartime farm. Find out how Britain fed itself during the Second World War by ordering the Open University's free wartime farm booklet. Call 0845 366 0257 or go to bbc.co.uk slash wartime farm and follow the links to the Open University. Home Guard are facing a battle to look younger. Dad's Army later at 7.40. For next on BBC Two, fighting for the title of One Man and His Dog Champions, this year's competition concludes in just a moment.